Lord Almighty, He is Lord, He is God indeed. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. The Lord reigns. He is a mighty God. The church family. It is good to see everyone tonight. Thank you for joining us for this online devotional. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you. We praise and honor and glorify you. We thank you for your son's death on the cross and we thank you for his resurrection. We thank you for him defeating sin and death and Satan. 
which gives us hope of eternal life with you. It lets us know that grave is not our final destination. I pray, God, that we can live every day in light of this fact and that every day we can live for you. It's in your son's name. Amen. We hope you've had a good day today. You've had a chance to spend time with family or friends or just, just a nice, quiet, peaceful day. And we wanted to offer this online a devotional to you so you could continue to think and reflect on, on Christ as we begin this new week. And the, the question I wanted to ask and start off with was, why is it that we are drawn to beauty? You know, if uh, you know, the world just says that, that uh, we evolved for the survival of the fittest, and that everything is just biological and evolutionary. And, and if that was the case, we would just be bred for survival. Everything would be about how do I survive, but that's not how it is. We, we love beauty, we're drawn to beauty. And the reason I bring this up is because the gospel is the greatest story ever told. Everybody refers to, to Jesus' sacrifice is like, that is so incredible, that's something we are drawn to. That's something that just, really stirs something within our, our soul. That wouldn't make sense if we were only just ev evolved from a goo in the ground, if, if God did not, had not placed that within inside of us. And so that's what I wanted to look at tonight. And actually, uh, Tessa and I, we, uh, and our kids for spring break, we actually got to go to the Grand Canyon. Um, a few weeks ago, and I recorded a devotional out there, and so I'm actually going to play that devotional for you, and then at the end of that, I'm going to come back here, and and uh, and I'm going to have a few concluding thoughts. So, so here it is. Let me let me go play this. All right. So Tess and I decided uh, several weeks ago that we wanted to go somewhere warmer for spring break, and as you can tell. We did a really good job of planning because it is cold out here, but we decided that we would go to the Grand Canyon. And it is incredible out here. I remember we came out to the Grand Canyon yesterday. And as we went out onto one of the most famous points, Mather Point, every single person was out there and they were just awestruck by the beauty of God's creation. People from different countries, from different religions, from different backgrounds, but nobody was not just awestruck by the beauty of God's creation. And I guess my question is, is why is it that we are drawn to beauty, that we are drawn to, to things that are bigger than us, that we are drawn to, to, to things that are just majestic and amazing and that just make our jaw drop. You know, if uh, see, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, who's an atheist, here's what he says. He says, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. You know, Richard Dawkins would say that that as humans, we just evolved from, from animals through just completely random means, that it wasn't guided at all, that it was just, um, we were bred in tooth and claw, that it was survival of the fittest. And if that was the case, it wouldn't make sense why humans are drawn to things that are so much bigger and grander and more amazing than us. But as a Christian, I know the answer. It is because we are made in the image of God. And God is the one who decided uh, through guided processes that he would make amazing and beautiful features like the Grand Canyon. As C.S. Lewis says it like this, he says, 
if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. And that's true, isn't it? <laughs> that, that we all have desires within us. And we try to fill those desires from things of this world, but we find ourselves that those things don't satisfy. And the only explanation is that we were made for another world. But as I said, I know why it is that we are drawn to beauty like this. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 11, uh, God's word says this. It says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. It says everything in this world, all beauty, all majesty, all glory, all power, all splendor, all of it, everything belongs to God. And God is head. He is above it all. And so even the most beautiful sights in the world, whether it's a beautiful sunset, whether it's looking out over the Grand Canyon, whether it's listening to an amazing uh, concert symphony, whether it's watching, reading an amazing uh, book, that, that God is the one who made all of that possible and got his head over it all. In Psalm 33, starting in verse 6, it says this. It says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. It says that God was able to breathe stars out of his mouth. This is the God that we serve all of creation points back to God's glory. And that's why we are drawn to beauty and to majesty and to splendor because they point back to our creator. You know, in, it, there's a famous episode in Jesus' life in John chapter 19. This is known as the, the triumphal entry that Jesus is, is coming into Jerusalem and that people are laying palm branches down on the ground and people are crying out and they are saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And people are praising God and people are glorifying God. And the Pharisees go to Jesus and say, Jesus, shouldn't you make them be quiet? Shouldn't you stop them? from uttering these things. And Jesus says, if I made people stop shouting out, then the rocks would cry out. Now, does Jesus literally mean that the rocks will will grow mouths and and start crying out, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord? I I don't know if that's exactly what he meant, but I think what he means is that it would be more possible for a rock to grow a mouth and to start speaking and to glorifying God than for people to see Jesus in his majesty and glory and not glorify God who is in heaven. It is the most natural response of us as human beings to glorify our creator. And so I just want to leave you with with one quick thought. Now, what's the purpose of all of this? Well, I think it can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, where it says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And so my question is, is in your life, what are you, what are you giving glory to? What is your focus is, it point, is your focus pointed outward where you're trying to impress others, where you're trying to make a name for yourself, where you're trying to get other people to see how great you are? Is your focus on yourself, trying to improve yourself and, and trying to just build yourself up and make yourself look good, whether it's you know academically or physically or mentally? Or is your focus upward where everything that you do is trying to glorify your creator in heaven.
May God bless you and let's do everything for God's glory. And that's the one thought I wanted to leave you with is how can we do everything for God's glory? I think if we were able to, to live our life for God's glory, it would help us to be more at peace. Because if bad things happen to us, if things don't go our way, if, if uh, life throws us a curveball, then we just say, hey, yeah, at least the, uh, the normal reaction I have is I get mad, I get angry, I get frustrated, uh, I get mad when, when things don't go the way that I think they're going to. It, it inconveniences me. Uh, but when we're able to realize that it's not about us, but it's about God, it, it helps me to be more at peace. It helps me to be more patient. It helps me to say, hey, that's okay that this didn't work out. Hey, that's okay that, that this person cut me off in traffic. Hey, that's okay that this person is, is taking a long time. Because it's not about me. It's not about me getting to the place I need to. It's not about me getting what I want. It's not about things going my way because it's about God. And so when we live for God's glory, it helps me to be more at peace. It also helps me to be more humble. It helps me to realize that, hey, uh, if someone wrongs me, if someone does something to make me angry, if someone um, does something to slight me in some way, usually I get mad, I get frustrated. But when I realize that I'm doing it for God's glory, it helps me to be more humble. It helps me to say, hey, if, even if they did that, that's okay. It, because this is not about my feelings. It's not about my rights or my privileges. And the way that I respond to that person is going to be a reflection of God. And so I'm going to respond in such a way to give glory to God. It helps me to be more humble. I, I think this ideal of living for God's glory is, is this organizing motif that affects every area of our lives. And as we think about Jesus dying on the cross, his crucifixion and his resurrection, it helps us to remind us that when Jesus lived his life, it wasn't about him. It wasn't about doing his will, but he did the will of the Father to glorify the Father and let us strive to do the same. Let's all have a blessed week. May God bless you.